so the people like Harriet Tubman, um, who ran the Underground Railroad and who were conductors, were incredibly brave and, and, and effective given their numbers. Um, but they knew that there was a limit to what they were accomplishing. So in a really successful year, they might pre, you know, 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 people and get them, you know, out of the south and escaped into the north or, or into Canada. Um, but the problem was that, that the growth of slavery at the time, the growth of enslaved people by, by birth, was far, far faster than they could make up for by, by smuggling people out through the Underground Railroad. So as time went on, people increasingly wanted to shift to more aggressive tactics, people like Harriet Tubman, and also people like this man, John Brown, who was a, a militant abolitionist. And he was not much for, for talking and dialogue. He was a man of, of action. So he would go to you know, abolitionist meetings and complain about how it was all talk and said, what we need is action, action. And so he hatched a plan along with several others. Um, and the plan was basically this. They would go to this, the armory at Harper's Ferry and they would seize the armory and they would, you know, kind of, they would, they would get the, the arms and the, the powder and so forth and they would dis sort of disseminate into the south in basically guerrilla groups and lead what some historians have called uh, an insurgency of self-defense. So they would go from plantation to plantation and they would liberate enslaved people and some of those people would go into hiding in the hills or remote areas and some of those people would kind of join this armed insurgency and it would spread and spread until all of the plantations uh, had been depopulated of the slaves and the economy of the South collapsed. Um, and there were many people, many historians who believe that this was actually a very sound strategy and would have worked out uh, perhaps very effectively and successfully if there weren't some hurdles along the way. Um, <laughs> and so one of the hurdles involved numbers. Uh, so John Brown, they, they had been kind of behind the scenes organizing to get people to show up um, for, this, for this event, for the kind of the start of this, of this uprising. Um, and they'd done fundraising and kind of underground logistics, and they'd gotten about a thousand uh, firearms that they would use to start off with, even before they took over, you know, this armory. Um, and so John Brown thought, you know, a thousand people, that would be perfect. A thousand uh, to start off with would be exactly what we need. And so on the morning of the action, the number of people who showed up was 20. So they had, you know, many, many arms per person at that point already. Um, but John Brown said, okay, well, you know, this problem isn't going to go away if we don't do anything. So we'll just go ahead with the people we have because that's what we've got to do. Um, and so, so they did. And they were able to successfully capture uh, the armory. And that's where things kind of went off the rails. And it's not exactly clear why they made some of the decisions that they did and why John Brown did. But they kind of, they captured a couple of, kind of townspeople who'd come to try to stop them um, from taking over the armory. Um, but instead of, of, you know, taking what they needed and moving on in the traditional kind of guerrilla hit and run fashion, which he probably wasn't very familiar with, they actually stayed in Harper's Ferry for a, a, a fairly long time. And they allowed these, these captured people to, you know, order up for breakfast and go on escorted visits with their families and this sort of thing. And so they stayed there for, you know, a day, by which time the, the army was able to march from the next town and they were captured and many of them were, were hanged. Um, and so he obviously made some tactical mistakes. Um, but what I think is, is, is interesting is, is how many people really condemned him at the time, even abolitionists. There is a fairly low level support among white abolitionists for, for John Brown. And they said, oh, you know, you've really gone too far. Like, this is really violent. How could you, you know, the same kind of pacifist, like, how could you fight violence with violence? This isn't going to work. Um, and one of the reasons that, that John Brown did this was because he really saw the writing on the wall, on the wall in the antebellum South. He saw that the, the growing uh, size of, of, of slavery, the increasing uh, you know, slave state power as they expanded, um, was really meaning, he saw that there was going to be a civil war, essentially, um, and that this conflict between these different forces was inevitably going to lead to great violence. And of course, 
that's what happened if only a few months after uh, the raid on Harper's Ferry. Uh, the Civil War broke out, and it was, uh, you know, in terms of, of soldier deaths, it was the bloodiest war in American history. More, more soldiers died then uh, than in any war before or since. And I think that this is a really important lesson for us to internalize, that being nice um, and that, you know, using persuasive tactics um, and using nonviolent tactics doesn't necessarily lead to a nonviolent outcome. In fact, it can lead to an extremely violent outcome. And I think that especially when we're uh, looking down the, uh, the barrel of a horrendous climate collapse um, and the effects of, of you know, destroying the biosphere of a planet, um, that the violence that we are going to face and experience uh, as, a, as a people in the next you know, few decades uh, are going to be really horrendous if we can't uh, identify and rapidly implement the strategies and tactics that are going to need to be used to stop that with the least amount of violence possible. Um, Another example of a, of a resistance movement that kind of went through different uh, developmental phases is the resistance movement in France during World War II. Here's a photo of, of Hitler shortly after Paris was occupied. Um, and so when France was initially occupied, people were really in a state of shock. Uh, you know, the Nazis had expanded and occupied Europe in a very short period of time. No one had really expected that they would you know, be, have so much power and so much control so quickly. Um, and so they were quite stunned. Uh, and early kind of examples of French resistance were not very inspiring. It started to change around 1943. There is a really dramatic shift uh, in the dialogue of, of underground resistance newspapers. So you saw, you know, newspapers that before had privileged spiritual resistance and argued for, you know, nonviolence and this sort of thing. They started publishing editorials saying it was the duty of every French person to assassinate Nazi officers <laughs> and this sort of thing. And you saw uh, a, a dramatic increase in that year of, of assassinations, also of sabotage, of attacks on rail lines and communication infrastructure, and all of these things. Um, and one of the, the reasons that, that it started to change at that time in particular was because it started to look like the Nazis might lose the war. So that kind of facade of invincibility that they had tried so hard to, to cultivate and stamp into people was starting to crack. And that, along with well-organized you know, underground infrastructure and communications, was really what enabled large numbers of people to take on that action, to take on more serious action, and to take on real resistance. Um, and I think that, in some ways, that we're approaching some parallels now. I think that the cracks in industrial civilization are really starting to show whether we're talking about you know, skyrocketing oil crises, uh, prices, food crises, you know, economic collapses. Um, and I think that then, uh, as now, it's time to make that shift uh, to a more serious kind of resistance. And I think that if we can do that, then we'll win.